Well, um, good afternoon. Very good day for everybody. I want to first of all welcome welcome all the participants of this seminar, but particularly our colleagues that foreigners that had a very strong and intense activity in the last days. But despite this, they accepted to come to this seminar and make the event. So thank you and welcome. But I also, <clears throat> right from the start, I want to give my special thanks to Britta Welfen, who has been a wonderful partner for the last, last years. And in this case, especially because she is, uh, <clears throat> brings the partnership of the research committee on the quality of democracy of the international political science. I also want to thank Professor Aiplonsky, director of the Institute of Advanced Studies, for the continued support to the research group on the quality of democracy and all the staff that turns possible events like this. So. Thank you for participating. Thank you to be here and welcome. I, I, I will pass the, the, the word now for the director, Ari Plonsky. Hi, good uh, oops. Hi, good afternoon. Um, I begin by okay. I begin by congratulating Professor Zelvro Moises for the valuable work of a decade of series group, the quality of democracy of our institute. Uh, there is a statement and a question in the original work proposal of the group. The statement is that Brazil at the time, 2013, uh, was completing around 25 years of the most of its most recent democratic experience. The question uh, is whether such progress would be enough to assert that democracy is fully consolidated. A similar question, but one that extends to Latin America, inspires this afternoon's important international seminar. I express the privilege of the Institute for Advanced Studies of University of Sao Paulo to receive first-rate top intellectuals as speakers and discussants. I ask permission to congratulate dear Professor Maria Hermina Tavares de Almeida for the emeritus title, which will be granted to her by Tefeleshi by the Humanities School on March 22nd. I express the joy of receiving Dr. Brigitte Weifen again at our institute. She spent several years at the University of Sao Paulo as a holder of the Martius Chair, based at also FLS, the Faculty of Humanities. I was personally touched by one of our joint activities during that period, the seminar on memory, democracy, and resistance, reflections on Nazi fascism in Germany. It took place on November 8th, 2018, the eve of the 80th anniversary of the infamous Kristallnacht. I remember the strong emotion I felt when I mentioned at the opening of that event, having my mother and my older brother, who at the time was a four, mo four months old baby, spent that night in Berlin, awaiting the return of her husband and his father, arrested and expelled from Germany a few days earlier a return that never happened. That emotion came back to me two weeks ago as we said the last goodbye to my brother. I thank the partnership of IPSA, Research Committee 34, the Quality of Democracy, and the organization of the seminar, as Professor Jose Alvaro Moises mentioned. By the way, we will have the opportunity to hear the comments of dear Professor Lourdes Sola, a former IPSA president. With due respect to political science colleagues, I conclude by bringing the reaction of this modest engineer to the seminar title. 
uh, democracy in Latin America is offered two options, regression or resilience. Now, the physical concept of resilience is the property of a material returning to it in its original form or position after seizing the tension incident on it. But the original position is not necessarily the desirable one. As stated by the Quality of Democracy Research Group original manifesto, while recognizing the advances made at the time, I quote, it is undeniable that the country, Brazil, lives with deficits and important distortions in the functioning of the democratic regime, unquote. So allow me to say that maybe there are not two, but three trajectories possible, regression, resilience, or advancement. I'm eager to know this afternoon if the third option is real or just an engineer's daydream. I applaud the event organizers and the speakers. I thank the Institute's team and greatly appreciate the digital presence of those who are interested in this utmost important issue. Well, <clears throat> I, I will present now a few ideas, a few words about the context of our seminar. But first of all, I want to, to stress again very much and take to Brita. She, we own the seminar and the organization to her. She now is the coordinator of the research group of the, the quality of democracy from the International Political Science Association. So, Brita, thank you very much. <clears throat> 2024 will be a decisive year for democracy. <clears throat> for democratic rule around the, whole, the world. In 60 countries, including Brazil, around 4 billion people will exercise their rights to vote, to choose their governments and, and representatives. This choice will be a good opportunity for us to evaluate the challenge that democracy has been facing in recent years, with crises that in many cases have resulted in the growth of populist aut autocracies, which threaten the guarantee of fundamental rights, freedom of expression, and the, the rule of law. Weeks ago, the Eco Economist Intelligence Unity issued a special warning based on the 2023 survey that about the democratic regression occurring today showing that the index of existing democracy has reached its lowest level since 2006, when the survey began to be carried out. When addressing the reasons for these setbacks, the Economist Intelligence Unit cited the reduction in civil liberties in most countries during the pandemic and dissatisfaction with the wars in Ukraine, Israel, and Gaza. Conflicts, according to them, fuel dissatisfaction with the political regime. But the Freedom House also recently released its annual assessment report on political rights and civil liberties in 195 countries, taking into account the electoral process, freedom of expression, fundamental rights, and the rule of law. According to the institution, in 2023, freedom in the world decreased for the 18th consecutive year and democracy retreated significantly. When addressing the reasons for these results, Freedom House cited fraud or inconsistent electoral process, wars, political violence, attacks on pluralism, and free expression. Variety of Democracy Project went all the way home when releasing its annual report in the last, last week. And 
drew, and drew attention to a crucial aspect. The world is almost evenly divided between 91 democracies and 88 autocracies. Then 71% of the world's population, that is 5.7 billion of people living in auto autocracies. <clears throat> While 29, only 29 of the world's population, 2.3 billion people live in the liberal and electoral democracies. These results confirm what has been happening since 2006. Democracy is in crisis everywhere, and it's under attack from a wave of autocratization that threatens its value. And many academics who have studied the topic are divided around two models to explain the transformation that are taking place in the world. On the one hand, the crisis is explained in terms of the problems and contradictions faced by the economy. When the economy stops growing, it gives rise to the loss of income, increased cost of survival, unemployment, and deepening inequalities. And then voters reject governments and tired of a game that doesn't seem to have an end, they also rise up against the democratic regime, giving opportunity for the growth of authoritarianism. On the other hand, the, the expansion of autocracies is also explained by political reasons, in particular by the deficits and distortions in the functioning of the democratic institution. The emptying of political parties, the encapsulation of elites, the practice of corruption, and the disconnection between those represented and representatives, especially the feeling that politicians look after their own interests, but not of those of voters, leads not only to distrust of institutions, but even in much cases in the rejection of political parts and parliaments associated with the idea that when facing serious problems, any government can disrespect the rule of law. <clears throat> Needless to say, <clears throat> how this, this picture can create a political support based for the growth of <coughs> autocracies and authoritarianism. These explanations of, of the role of the economy and political institutions are quite relevant to, to explain important parts of the empirical reality. But I think that they do not fully account for the complex situation in many countries. There, are a no, there is another relevant aspect that like the economy and the dynamics of institutions is at the origin of conditions that open space for crisis and create opportunities for the expansion of the autocracies. This phenomenon refers to the values, attitudes, and behavior of population, especially voters, regarding the complex and contradictory functioning of the democratic regime. The concept, ideas, and perceptions of ordinary people about how the governments work, how politicians behave, the role of institutions, the abuse of power, such as corruption, and especially inequalities concerning rights, <clears throat> lead people to actually distrust from the system to the political system. The inexistence of a civic culture alongside, alongside the good functioning of economy and the virtuous performance of institutions is also an important factor to explain crisis or the survival of democracy. In other words, the presence among the strong segments of the population of attitudes of rejection, indifference, or distrust of institutions, such, <coughs> such as political parts in parliament and the judiciary, creates a fertile ground for the emergence of populist movements and leaders that present themselves as defensors of anti-politics, 
the radical alternative to traditional elites, or all the saviors of the country. This situation is, is, can be exemplified by the <coughs> important aspect of the relevant political life, Brazilian political life. Would the election of Jair Bolsonaro, <coughs> with all the threats of democracy that he implied, be possible if it weren't for a mass of voters who support authoritarian and conservative values and who gave him victory in 2018, and almost 50% of the votes in 2022. In other words, it's not only the economy and the institutions, dimensions that facilitate or the making <coughs> of autocracies. The attitudes and behavior of the people also count for that, and it can give strength or take out power from politicians like Bolsonaro. So my suggestion is that the dimension referred to, to the political culture of people should be taken into consideration for the analysis of the phenomenon of autocratization and crisis of democracies. Thank you. So <clears throat> I will pass the coordination of the session to Brita, and we will start to hear the presentations and comments that our colleagues will make. Brita. All right. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you so much. Moises, Ari, for your warm welcome and um, the opening uh, of this seminar this afternoon. It's really a pleasure to be back. It's like being back home, in a way, to be back in Sao Paulo, back at USP. Because as was mentioned before, I lived here for six years in total and uh, was a visiting professor here at the University of Sao Paulo. And in that role I organized various events, also bringing some scholars from Germany or from other European countries, usually bring them together with uh, colleagues from Brazil, in some cases also other Latin American countries, for events, well, on topics of common interest, and including some on the crisis of democracy, um, all kinds of challenges to human rights, for instance. Um, and unfortunately, these topics have not lost their currency, so we are still discussing these. Um, and the occasion today really is that it's, it's, I, I seized the opportunity really to bring over or to bring some people here to uh, the Instituto de Estudos Avanzados, given that we had uh, a workshop the past two days, uh, which is an author's workshop for a book project, um, and this is organized by uh, the, the Cluster of Excellence scripts, contestations of the liberal script. It's a big research center based in Berlin, based in Germany. Um, so at this point, I also have to acknowledge the support from scripts because our international participants came here for this event. So the main burden of the costs of travel, etc., were, of course, paid by scripts. Um, but then in addition to that, I also have some support from IPSA, from the International Political Science Association. Uh, as um, has been mentioned already, I'm currently the chair of the research committee 34, Quality of Democracy, um, which works exactly also on these questions, on challenges to democracy, how to define challenges, how to conceptualize them, the rise of populism and authoritarianism. Um, so all these kinds of issues that we are facing. Um, and so there's always an interest from the research committees also to organize some events in between the big IPSA World Congress um, events, right? Um, so yeah, so that's kind of the inspiration of or the idea behind this event. Um, and then also, of course, um, as a third partner, if you want, we have the Grupo de Pesquisa Qualidade da Democracia here at EAR USP, which of course, as you can see already from the name uh, of the two research groups or committees, is a great match because it's 
essentially the same name, <laughs> obviously. Um, um, and so we've worked together in the past, even when other people chaired the research committee. Um, and I think so in that sense, we also continue a long legacy of fruitful collaboration. Um, now, without further ado, I would like um, briefly to explain what the kind of chronolog chronological or the dynamics, let's put it like this, of the seminar will be. Um, so we will have, we will kind of make a dialogical structure, if you want, starting with one speaker and then have the discussant or comment commentary from one of our distinguished colleagues here who we invited. Uh, and then hand back to the next presenter and then the next comments and then probably take a break at some point in between to grab something to drink or coffee um, and then continue and then also open up for questions from the audience. So yeah, as first two figures to be prominent here, I would like to invite Professor Aaron Schneider and Professor Lourdes Solar here to the stage. And I will briefly introduce you also. I mean, I know um, Lourdes especially is probably well known to many of our local participants here. Nevertheless, I think it's important, um, but not, not the whole CV. Uh, we don't have time for that. But um, So Professor Aaron Schneider is professor and Leo Block chair at the Joseph Corbel School of International Studies at the University of Denver in the United States. Um, and he is doing research on topics such as public finance um, with a specific focus on Latin America and Brazil in particular, I think, but also on India. Uh, I think you've also done projects related to Central America. Um, and then besides public finance, public economics, also on urban politics and development. Um, so yeah, well, one could say his work focuses on the intersection of wealth and power. Um, and he studies uh, public finance as a way to understand the political economy of development and democracy. Um, and has published books on state building in Central America, urban development in the United States. Um, and there's an ongoing project comparing India and Brazil. And then Lourdes Sola is sitting next to me here. She is a, a retired professor at the University of Sao Paulo with many stations in her life, including Brazil, including Oxford in the UK and many others. I don't, I don't think we have time to go to all of this. <laughs> so I just, just want to mention already and specifically emphasize that you also have a long involvement with the International Political Science Association, founder of and member of various research committees there and also part of the, what it's called, the, the leading entities, I don't remember now, and of course you were the president of IPSA also um, in the past, which also meant that you had to organize the World Congress. So a long involvement with, with uh, IPSA. Um, and um, in terms of her research interests, I think she's a very nice match for Aaron because she also does work on political science and political economy. Uh, with a particular focus on the structure and transformation of the state. Um, but also democratic theory, comparative politics more broadly, democratization, democracy, global processes of change, both political and economic, and how they hang together. Um, yeah, and polit public policies um, and construction of political institutions. Um, yeah, so I'm very happy to have both of you here, and I'm really looking forward to what you have to say to each other and to the audience. So I won't talk much longer, but we'll hand over to Aaron now. So if we want, I don't know, we, we have this thing here, so we can... Okay. So thank you, Brigitte, of course. I'm gonna set a timer here, just so I make sure I keep within time or at least close to it, 20 minutes is right. Um, so of course, big thanks to Brigitte for organizing this event and, and, and securing funds to support all of us and, and, uh, and you know, uh, 
uh, keeping the energy going from the Scripps conference, that workshop that we just had. And so it's nice to see the Scripps friends here and colleagues. And, uh, and of course, I have uh, friends here uh, who shaped the way that I understand political science and compared to Bugs and Minia. Minia is here to comment, and that's really special. And Lourdes Sola, of course, who um, Brigitte said was a, a good match. And in fact, Lourdes has been uh, teaching me since 2000 when she saw me as a PhD student at UC Berkeley and was there as a Brazil chair. So um, this is a nice reunion for me, too. Um, I'm going to speak today about, I, this is a terrible title, but democracy, dictatorship, categories and responses. And let's see if that, yep, there we go. Um, so there are um, different ways that we think about uh, these major macro social concepts with respect to democracy and its counterpart dictatorship or autocracy. Um, the first couple things that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show are drawn, as you may remember from that old article, David Collier and Steve Levitsky, who's written some things since then. He's on TV nowadays, on The Daily Show last night. So he's, he's kind of made it, I guess, as far as academics go. Um, but this is, they distinguish between classical approaches and radial approaches to these, these regime concepts. And they note that uh, many people treat things like authoritarianism as a, in a classical way. And this draws on the work of Giovanni Sartori, uh, who wanted to make sure that when we conceptualize, we don't stretch our concepts, compare cases that probably are different, are just qualitatively different uh, and, and don't belong in the same, in the same box. Um, and, and, uh, and in order to do that, he suggests that the way we think about concepts is that there are some core components that are sort of required to be a member of the category. Um, and if you want to uh, uh, specify particular kinds of um, of this, the, the, the category that you're looking at, you can move down the ladder of analysis by adding attributes. So to the limited pluralism and distinctive mentality, the two primary components that, that Juan Lin described for authoritarianism, you could add mobilizing labor, uh, mobilizing middle classes in some cases, and talk about a populist authoritarianism. Um, now then, obviously, fewer cases fit into the box of populist authoritarianism than authoritarianism. We withdraw components in order to move up the ladder and encompass more cases within those, those categories. And you can, you can compare within categories, but just we have to remember and know that if we were to compare populist authoritarian, include populist authoritarian cases, we can compare them to other authoritarian cases as authoritarian cases that share those core components, not as of uh, uh, populist authoritarianism. And, and similarly, you could add a different set of components, uh, the triple alliance um, between uh, international capital, domestic capital, and the state, uh, uh, organizing against and, and attempting to withdraw rights from lower classes. And you could characterize that as bureaucratic authoritarianism, adding a, a, a component to what the, the, the main category is and moving down that, that ladder of abstraction. So there are these implications for the way we do social science, what we can compared to what concepts sort of mean. There are, there are hard boundaries around cases that, that help us to avoid stretching, to understand what those concepts really are. And if we want to make arguments and test, test hypotheses, we should do it within categories um, and, and be aware of, of what those categories are. Um, Levitsky and, and Collier suggest that there are other ways of thinking about concepts, the radial approach, and it's connected to the family resemblance uh, uh, approach or uh, um, a, a uh, uh, um, yeah, anyway, uh, the radial approach. And what this understands concepts to entail are categories that have perhaps an expansive list of primary components. And we learn about the cases in terms of their conceptual mapping, their relation to that primary core, because many cases may represent some of the components, but not others. And so we become, we become aware of cases that are kind of connected to or related to the core, but located somewhat outside of it along one or another dimension. So if the primary category of democracy includes these four characteristics, participation, competition, limits on state power, and equity, this would be a sort of a complete, perfect, may not even exist anywhere. The, I, these are ideal typical sorts of, of conceptualizations. But then we can start to understand what we see in the world in relation to this core uh, um, 
category by starting to move away from it, draw, draw down some of the, the components. So we could think of participatory democracy that you know, emphasizes participation and doesn't especially emphasize some of these other ones. Or liberal democracy that has participation, competition, perhaps checks on state power, not so much emphasis on, on equity. And popular democracy, perhaps high levels and patterns and institutions of participation and attention to equity, but not as much attention to some of these others. This is a different way of thinking about categories, moving up and down the ladder of abstraction now, of course, in order to, 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 to move down, in a sense, we're, we're looking at diminished subtypes, subtypes that are outside of the core. They're still related on some dimensions, but, but uh, away from the core on, on others. Uh, we could even imagine enhanced types. We could add a dimension to democracy. Some people treat the equity dimension as a sort of an additional so the, that, that, that if democracy includes the first three, participation, competition, and, and limits on it, and state power, that maybe the enhanced type is one that adds equity as sort of an extra characteristic that makes it a, a, an enhanced type. So they don't, we don't have to use sub, sub, uh, uh, diminished subtype as some sort of a negative connotation, but it's, sort, it's more of just a mapping to understand the relation to the core. Um, as you can imagine, the more extension, the more components we add, the more cases we possibly can include in our comparison. So there's sort of a different dynamic than from Sartori's classical approach in which the more components you add, the fewer cases fit into the, into the, the, the boxes. Um, of course, you know, the applications, um, this is not an application that I particularly love, but, but Castaneda came up with his sort of categorizations of kinds of lefts. And he, he argues that, you know, there's kind of a, a good left and a bad left. And he distinguishes amongst the, the, the lefts of the first wave. And he distinguishes amongst the lefts of the second wave. Um, and the, the, the key is that he's using a, a classical sort of an approach in, in, by setting the core components of these regimes. What do they, 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 they entail? And then he's coming up with subtypes, good and bad, according to, uh, you know, uh, corruption and, and the, the fiscal irresponsibility and attack on, uh, on, on rights, especially the rights of, um, of upper classes, I guess, in, 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 uh, in some of the, the populist uh, versus social democratic kinds of, of, of left. So as we add components, we move down the ladder of abstraction, we end up with, with, with fewer cases. Um, uh, one, one I mean, among the various critique, it makes, makes it hard to, to compare the, these cases. Um, it does lump in, or even maybe even ignores, what the threats to democracy from the right are in this framework. You know, so here we've got a way of, of moving up and down the ladder of abstraction for the left, but we don't really have any clues for what happens on the right. And so I, I see this as sort of limited conceptually and also in terms of what, what, what we can do with it. Um, there, are, there are radial approaches. And we know that the sophistication, the statistical, you know, tools that are being applied to radial classifications of democracy don't don't worry too much about what country is where. But we, what we can see is that this is a, a way of treating the dimensions of democracy as continuum. It can be higher or lower, closer to the core or farther away from the core uh, in terms of the the, the concept. Uh, and it's it's useful. You can make comparisons, statistical comparisons, sophisticated tools to, to make those comparisons. Uh, you can test hypotheses. You can identify problems, perhaps, on one or along along one or another dimension that that you may think is import, important. Um, but there are a couple things that I observe with this approach that also make me a little bit dissatisfied. And that's to say, you know, if we look at uh, 2021 and and Bolsonaro's Argentina. Uh, don't think anybody else would make that mistake. But anyway, Bolsonaro's Brazil and Fernandez's Argentina are pretty close. I, I, let's see what the numbers are. It's 40, uh, 47 and 50 on this scale. So they, are they the same? Were, were they both undemocratic or, or less democratic in the same way? I, I, I don't think we would say that. But these kinds of measures can lead us to those sorts of conclusions that you know, as you move away from the core, you move away in the same way. Uh, Another observation is that also just the implication that may not it may not be necessary for this kind of conceptualization, but the implication is that the movement away from the core is continuous. These are incremental changes. You can kind of like erode, so the verb er eroding democracy is the one that we use because it's the sense that things happen kind of incrementally. Um, 
I think that we know that democracy erodes in different ways in different places. And making a distinction with Bolsonaro and, and Fernandez is something that I would say we should paying attention to in terms of what are the possible threats to democracy in these, in these cases. Um, and I also am not so sure that erosion and, and improvement happens in this incremental way. If we look at history, we think about the way in which we, we think about history, we often think about sort of jumps, you know, uh, uh, moving on to and off of paths. And so uh, there are ways of thinking about uh, paths, evolutionary approaches. And, and here, just to the terminology, phonetic approaches sort of say, we can identify if something is a mammal or a bird by looking at its characteristics, the, the phenotype. And it's got a beak, it's got claws, it's a bird. If it you know, uh, uh, nurses its young and, and carries them through a pregnancy, then it's a, it's a mammal. So we have these characteristics. We use them to, to, to separate these, these paths. But evolutionary approaches say that's, that, that uh, uh, doesn't always work because the duck-billed platypus. And now I give this example with apologies to uh, Oliveira, who of course applied this analogy to to, uh, to Brazil in, in a different context and different argument. But you know, there are some cases that if we take a snapshot of beak, uh, uh, webbed feet, lays eggs, is venomous. So is it a bird? Is it a reptile? We know that it's a mammal, though, because of course the the trajectory that it's on, the path that it's on. So I think paying attention to paths can be really important, especially as we think of like, well, what are our categories? What is it, a, is it a snapshot of core components, or do we pay attention to history and paths and path dependence? Um, and of course, uh, the critical junctures approach, which at Berkeley, we did a lot of that, and, and uh, uh, it, you know, takes this sort of a, a, an approach and says there are certain moments when different paths are set and we can understand what are the characteristics of cases because they they branched at one point or another on the on these paths, and you know the argument is that the, these the path, the branching points are you know macro social moments, and so there's you know literature on Central America, the legacies of liberalism, which traces the five countries of Central America along paths according to how they dealt with the turn of the 1800 1900s uh, uh, movement to commodity agriculture, a big change in the way in which they fit into the international economy. Collier and Collier, uh, their, their book on labor incorporation, asked a similar question of the 1930s and 1940s and says the different ways in which countries responded to the industrialization process, another new way of, of organizing the economy and inserting into the international economy, uh, and especially incorporating the new social actor at the time, labor, defines different paths for, for countries, more uh, that end, has to end up in, in democracies that remain more or less stable, has to end up in dictatorship, breakdowns in dictatorship. Um, the globalization transition and the, the, the neoliberalism and neo-developmentalism associated with the, you know, the last 30, 40 years is another major macro-social change in terms of the way in which Latin American countries fit into the national economy, organize their economies, and all sorts of social questions have to be answered. And some people like Ken Roberts and, and Scott Handlin identify, you know, what are the choices, if you want to call them that, or what are the, the branches that lead to different paths for different countries? Um, and I won't, you know, do too much with it, but um, just to say, and I'll, I'll say a little bit about Handlin's, Handlin's framework because I think it's, it's useful to give an example. But, but uh, uh, you know, the advantage of, of this approach is that, you know, what the core components, what are the things that are important about to characterize democracies, are allowed to change over time. It's about these social questions. You know, how do you incorporate labor? And then that can then set you on paths and, and, and allow you to, to distinguish between democratic regimes and democratic and, and authoritarian regimes. So there's, there's something useful to this incorporation of, of world time into the story. Um, and also, it has implications for you know, how democracy erodes. The way democracy erodes in a country that's followed one path may look very different from the way in which a democracy erodes in another in a country that's followed another path, and therefore our response should be different. I'll, I'll say a little bit about this at the end, but, but uh, you know, the way in which we think about it, how do we nudge or, or, or you know, move back to a more democratic path if you're on one of these branches versus another? Uh, so, so Hanlon's uh, uh, argument, and Ken Roberts makes an argument, he says, the key branching point is neoliberal, the neoliberal adjustment of the 1990s. Hanlon sort of says, actually, the key moment in this globalization period is the way in which the, the pink tide 
plays out in different countries. And there's a branching that's driven by these two concepts. Uh, the, the, the organization of the left, its, its infrastructures, uh, and the capacity of the state. Where you have a, a left like Brazil, the Workers' Party, with a, a, a penetration society, with a, an, organized, or an organization, with the capacity uh, to, to, uh, to sustain itself over time, and a state with a, a degree of capacity by many, by many measures. Um, uh, well, then you get up and Uruguay, Chile also have some of these sorts of, of characteristics. And we talk about one path that they follow. The kind of left that emerges there is going to be different than the kind of left that emerges where there wasn't really a left with that sort of established partisan organization, Venezuela, uh, uh, Bolivia, Ecuador, uh, where the party system had collapsed. And Robert spends a lot of time explaining why party systems collapse or not. Um, and the state was not is not a particularly capable state. That's a different path for the lefts that emerge in those places. And it, you know the characteristics that we see in the left in, in those places uh, are, are going to be different. And, and the, the threats to democracy in those places are, are going to be different. Uh, and then there's the third case, the places that have neither, I'm sorry, neither the left or the state, Paraguay and, and Peru. I misspoke earlier. But anyway. Uh, you get the point. There, there, there are two variables that allow us to distinguish between three different paths, and that, that we can then make sense of what are the threats to democracy in these different places because there are different paths, and how do we then respond to them in a, a particular way? Uh, I want to suggest that, uh, and this is this is the part of this argument that is I'm trying out, and we'll see how it goes. And but I, I think that the macro social challenge that we're we're facing is sort of an evolution of globalization. If we look at this little chart here on the right, uh, 1975, so the, the tail end of that post-World War II period, it's, these are the, the largest companies by uh, uh, market capitalization. Exxon, GM, Ford, Texaco, Mobil, oil and cars, right? So this is that industrial economy of the post-war period, and, and those were the major companies. They were adapted to where, where the rents were, the surpluses were in the international economy. By 1995, 20 years later, General Motors, Ford, cars, Exxon, oil's still there. Oil's always there, right? But, uh, but then Walmart and AT&T. So uh, uh, information communication, uh, telecommunications is in there. And Walmart, for me, really represents that sort of evolution of capitalism where if in the post-World War II industrialization phase, you sort of pulled stuff out of the ground, transformed it, assembled it into a, a product, distributed it, and consumed it in, in a place, and you would build a Ford factory top to bottom in Brazil. Well, globalization, sorry, um, and I will wrap up if I can figure out how to do that. Um, I have two minutes left. So, uh, so uh, in, in globalization, of course, you pull stuff out of the ground in one place, you transform it in another, you, you assemble it in another, you, you distribute it, consume it in another, and it's that integrated global assembly line that uh, is the way in which the international economy is organized. And Walmart is sort of the, the expert or the perfect example of figuring out how do you coordinate that whole transnational assembly line? How do you insert yourself so that you get a few cents off of every t-shirt that's being made? Because you control when the cotton is picked and the textiles are, are sewn and the, and the t-shirt is made and when it's put in the shelves and in the warehouse and all the rest. So we see this transformation by 1995 and then by 2015, Apple, Google, Microsoft are on there, oil is still there, finance, Berkshire Hathaway is on there. And then by 2020, now 2020 is COVID year, so there's something special about it, but even looking at 21, 22, th there's a similar story. Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Alphabet, Alphabet Facebook. The companies that have figured out how to uh, uh, generate, capture, um, uh, house, analyze, and then commodify data are the ones that now have inserted themselves into all of those global value chains. So when, when Walmart wants to know, should we be selling black jeans or blue jeans, they ask Amazon, what are people buying? And Amazon has that data, has that information. So Amazon has inserted itself into all these value chains because they've got the data that all of these other firms need. Um, well, this is a huge change, and it happens to have it happens to occur at the same time as the rise of China as an environmental crisis. So we have this international moment. I think that many of the you know conflagrations that we see around the world and the the, the challenges are coming from the fact that we're now unsure how do we respond democratically to this this challenge. So the countries of Latin America, uh, like all countries, have to 
have to respond. And there are new requirements of developing countries. And this is true of every one of these movements. With each new insertion from commodity agriculture to industrialization to globalization to digitalization, there are sort of new demands placed on the economic actors and the state in developing countries. Um, they have to come up with now the ability to compete at this technology frontier, or at the very least negotiate with these quasi-monopolistic firms on you know, capturing some or accessing some of the rents that are available from this, this new economy. A digital industrial policy, pursuing competitive advantage, investing in you know, education and, and technology clusters and these kind of things. So there's a lot that's required of developing countries in order to take advantage of this moment. And, and that's true of, of Latin America uh, too. So, um, and this is the last slide I'll show, and hopefully it's not too hard to understand. But my the 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 way in which I'm going with this um, with this argument is that you know we can say that at each of these moments, at each of these macro historical moments, you have factions of your elite, of your upper classes, that are adapted to the new international insertion, the new way of organizing the international economy, and you have factions of your elite that are not. Um, and then you have lower class actors that, that are drawn in in one way or another into this, into this moment. And so you can imagine different coalitions forming, and this was a lot of what that critical junctures approach of the Colliers and Mahoney and, and Hanlon and Roberts is mapping these co coalitions. And, and you know, for my purposes, I'm very interested in these upper and lower class coalitions. And we can think of sort of the left side as those who are pushing for this new economy, and the right side are those who perhaps are not as well adapted. But they have oftentimes institutional power, political power, the ability to force certain uh, accommodations. So we can imagine different um, coalitions forming. You can imagine an elite coalition. And so I'm going to uh, uh, open myself up to the, the valid critiques of all of our Brazilian colleagues by saying, let's just say that you know there was a neoliberal coalition, an upper class coalition of the, the the declining and the and the and the rising elites, and they came together and they wanted to pursue an upper class sort of redistribute wealth upwards and use that to to, to respond to this new international challenge, this new international economy. Temer, Temer has this you know project that he enters, but what we saw in the in the Temer period was that there wasn't a whole there, there's not an electoral base for this, right? There what it, it was it was it was a project, right? It was a coherent project, the the bridge to the future. Coherent project in response to what was what were the challenges, but there wasn't so much of a, a, a an electoral appeal. Um, the the counter project that the the that Lula and the Workers Party pr pr present is one where they say, okay, well, we're going to accommodate uh, uh, certain factions of capital, and we're going to incorporate lower classes. We're incorporating lower class with more democracy, with more social programs, with with uh, 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 ways in which they will be brought into this new. Uh, uh, strategy of insertion into the national economy. Um, an alternative is this one. And, you know, in some ways I would say that Bolsonaro is sort of the combination of that yellow and green, so it's the sort of the upper class project along with an exclusionary lower class appeal. If you are the right kind of Brazilian, right, if you're not Afro-Brazilian, indigenous, gay, uh, you know, the many categories that aren't the right kind of, of Brazilian, well then you're not included. But for the right kinds of Brazilians, there's all sorts of validation and efforts to incorporate them in this coalition. And this is sort of the competition that we see in Brazil is that the neoliberal alone coalition wasn't really electorally viable. But you got the left sort of neo-developmentalist coalition. You got the right, uh, uh, I'm saying it's neo-fascist. I don't know if it is. But anyway, some combination of neoliberalism and this exclusionary uh, uh, appeal. Um, and it's worth saying that as we look across Latin America, of course, there's this. Venezuela, Cuba, Nicaragua have responded, and now that Cuba's been doing it for a very long time, but they're responding to globalization and, 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 and now digitalization by saying, well, we'll simply attack the elites. We'll mobilize lower classes and try to forge a, a regime out of that social coalition. Now, they've had to, had to, they have chosen to you know, uh, 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 attack and, and deteriorate democracy because that coalition there can't survive without those sorts of you know, attacks on, on democracy, without, without constraining democracy in that way. So these are four responses. Is it four? One, two, three. Yeah, four, four responses to, I think, this moment that I think we can make sense of by, by, by you know, putting cases into these 
categories and understanding that they're branching on the basis of the class coalition that they bring into this response to a new international economy. So I went over, I apologize, and I'll stop now. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so I just, without further ado, I hand over to Lourdes. Hello. Well, uh, I thank you, Brita, and the coordinators of the liberal contestation of liberal script, and for the opportunity to interact with the colleagues, and to uh, to see uh, everyone's present to hear everyone's presentation after 26 years, 23 mm -hmm. about. Yeah, okay. Uh, I had to rely on this slide and on the essay you sent me, uh, published in Al Jazeera's journal or something. And uh, I came to the conclusion that you were really engaged, very much engaged in the dialogue with the, the American literature, basically, which I share with you a few things. No, I'm really involved with uh, with uh, historical institutionalism and this kind of approach. But I think that uh, there are a few things that always uh, uh, always uh, uh, strike me about those kind of dialogues. And this is that strikes me and strikes students or those with whom I do research that, um, well, how this really is really consistent with our experience. So I had to deal in this, to prepare this, my comments, uh, thinking of Aaron's slides and this uh, essay on Al Jazeera, where he really emphasized the unique traits. So in a way, in direct way, valuing in a way case studies, in a way you are really prone to, and that, uh, really being American, I think that half of the production about American government are case studies. <laughs> so, the, and I, I think, I am not sure that I agree with your final, but I do uh, emphasize the importance of your attempt to redefine, uh, but it's still, to my view, is a classic, and it, a, a say an attempt at classifying in order also to uh, correct the ways that uh, the US intervene in a way to promote democratization. And I couldn't share more uh, your criticism, but I go more, I, I go further, and I think I go further in order to make my points right. Uh, when I uh, uh, I must, uh, I must uh, uh, inform you that in his essay, he really emphasized uh, there's a lot of criticism about the uh, sanctions U.S. uses to promote uh, to promote uh, transitions to democratization. I agree very, very much with that, and we produce in my research group. I am here, have a research group on international. Uh, political economy, uh, varieties of democracy, and decarbonization. So uh, two members of our group, uh, one of which is really the chair of the IPSA committee, which I, start, I founded, which is uh, International Political Economy, he published a very recent piece, uh, Sergio Valli and uh, and Eduardo Viola, a piece of analyzing the sanctions, but from our point of view, not from the American point of view. Okay. From our point of view, it was it required a far much more fine tuning in the analysis, in terms of international environment and of the domestic environment. I just give the example. What happens, well, they show in a very econometric good work that the sanctions, uh, the U.S. Change sanctions, economic sanctions to Russia after Ukraine war do not work. 
do not work. Why? Because Russia is, produces commodities and has demand in China. So most of the, so neutralize the effect, economic effect. Of course, uh, uh, Iran is aware of the humanitarian side of the, but I mean, from the economic point of view, it doesn't work. But then they raise another possibility. What if China intervenes in Taiwan? What would happen? Then we would have, because of the kind of production that, that Taiwanese lead, you would have a big recession because they produce with rare, uh, so uh, all kinds of produ products that almost they are the only, only producers. So this would produce a, or a recession, but still Brazil would have means to export commodities to China. So when I say fine tuning is to consider the cases according to the problematic that you have. And so I'm not, I don't disagree with your uh, account of all the, those radio democracy and your proposal. But I think I would be much more useful for the purpose of the, of the meeting regression or progression to go on by stressing or drawing from what we have in common, which is you start with, for you, there are important aspects to draw from critical junctures, macro historical junctures, so what time. So I would like to uh, just to point out one thing with which I would like to start my own, my own way of thinking. And this is that I resort whenever I, I am in a very strong situation of analytical uncertainty, which corresponds to intellectual uncertainty or political uncertainty. I resort to Hirschman's, to Hirschman's, a, um, to Hirschman's who has a piece uh, in 70, he published in 71, it was a high time of uncertainty for Latin Americans, where he says the title is The Search for Paradigms May Be a, a Hindrance for Comprehension. So I, that's where I want to go. I think that uh, this major guideline, I made it my guideline whenever I face uncertainty, and you are in a very strong situation of uncertainty, especially from, 20s, from the 20s, that most people call at the international level polycrisis. COVID reshaped the arenas of production. Uh, we have the wars, the two wars, and so the geopolitical and geoeconomic blocks in a situation of very, very strong ties of interdependence. So I go to your, your book. So, uh, but what I want to say here is that my concern with, and is, is, is Aron's also, uh, the are the prospects of democratization and uh, autocratization for us, for us as Latin Americans. So we grapple with the critical challenge whenever we, we face a comparative question we, f we face really a, a, a critical challenge, which is the balance between generalization and comprehension. Uh, and, but I think that for Latin America, or for those, oh, for industrializing countries, I avoid global south, the word mm. global south, I think that we have more than one challenge. The challenge is much, much more uh, radical in a way is uh, because the balance between generalization and comprehension may go uh, through the, the, I mean, the uniqueness of certain experience that must be taken in, into account in order to explain, for example, whether in our case we managed, we managed to bar autocratization, at least the trend, 
but we are not, we've not dispelled the threat. So this kind of issue is right at the center of my concern at the moment. And I would like to, to really to go on by uh, thinking the way you, you present the lower class, in a way, is somehow remindful of Colin to me when he thinks, when he approaches decolonization from different perspectives. Latin America, those who really transited in a way quite different from Asians and so on, and shaping different challenges and different ways of uh, dealing with especially technological change more easily than the Latin Americans, or more easily, more in a more consistent way, and without such radical fiscal challenges as we do have. And I'm happy that you take, that you compare India, because we have produced, Lawrence White, Red and I, democratic statecrafting perspective from Global South, where you compare, I mean, the case of India and the case of Brazil, but we had to stop in before it was 20, we finished in 20. After the poly crisis, a different thing, we have a major. So, uh, when we, you, you take, I mean, my problem starts really, not problem, my, my question, uh, with your notion of critical terms. Uh, of course, they branch out in different ways. I couldn't agree more. Uh, but perhaps the way you approach the, the drive, the main drive, which is the, the insertion of lower classes and the need of the relationship, perhaps sounds to me... Oh, sorry. It's, it sounds to me... Uh, a bit, a bit deterministic. And so I would like to, to hear how, how, how do you react. Because it's very evolutionary, I share that. It really uh, focuses on specificities or asks for this. Uh, doesn't really skip this problem. And at some, but at the same time, the colonial heritage as a centerpiece of, of the evolution appears to be as a bit, a bit uh, uh, deterministic. Looking, I'm, I'm thinking of Brazil now, but I, I, will, I hope to be able to, to, to present in which way I, I am. Well, the father or forefather of this critical juncture tradition of historical institutionalism, um, Gudovic, uh, well, he relies on a more multi-dimensional structure, which I think I would prefer to approach the question. And this is the political economy, how the world time impacts, or the changes in the world time, impacts in the political economy of the country. And he conceives in a very simple way what the political economy is a set of interests, ideas, and institutions. And so we can compare according to the way a change or that challenge that really is, is a challenge of democratic governance that you present for Latin American countries. Uh, I think that this is, the point is how this world type will affect the, or affects the political economy of Brazil, Argentina, or Mexico, and so on, and, dif and will affect differently according to, and that's, I come with the international dimension, the way it is inserted in the regional and the, in the global setting. So this is important just to stress, because uh, in, at, the, at the moment, when we have a reconfiguration, of uh, reconfiguration of power, geopolitical and geoeconomic. I think that a, con a more concrete analysis is, is uh, so I would opt for a bit more of uh, comprehension in order to uh, less 
concerned with classification. And you are able to do that because you, you have two things which I, I find it important. You know how uh, India transited to, uh, to the global integration, how, in a way, globalized, how Brazil has behaved. So this is a good point to make. Uh, and how this international dimension was responded according by domestic forces. But those domestic forces really they require a more political, more of a political analysis or political economy analysis than a classification or reclassification of democracies uh, uh, require. And I perhaps in a minute, if I have time, more time. Uh, <laughs> no, but the, 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 okay, uh, so while I share your evolutionary perspective, I would call attention to two things that the third generation of historical institutionalists, when I say third generation, I'd say that Budavich's forefather, then Collier, either the first, and then we have uh, Hall and Talon and so on. But the third generation, the more recent, they call attention less, less, uh, or the emphasis, it's not that they reject critical juncture, but they really call attention, a lot of attention, uh, on gradual change, gradual, gradualistic change. Now, what I mean by that, more than that, there are two things that they call attention, how institutions change. They are more concerned with institutions but, than with political economies, but how institutions evolve and change. They make two points which I find it important when we think of Brazil. Uh, and one is what I, I said already, it's the gradual change, what makes all the drives of change so that I make room for stress, points of stress, triggers, until you have a change, but to observe those points. But especially also to contingency, to more contingency. Brazil is a, is a country for, as a destiny prone to a number of contingencies. For example, the fact <laughs> that we had to deal with the royal family to come, so that in the 19th century, Brazil was an empire. And this shaped, to my view, shaped the nostalgia of the poder moderador, a kind of thing that comes back, comes whenever you have a power question, you have a poder moderador at mobilize in a way, or the idea. This is a contingency. The other contingency, for, for example, the death of, premature death of uh, Tancredo Neves, so that possibly the policy mixes would be different in the transition. All this, I mean, so this approach, coming back to the third generation, the approach which includes gradual change, but looking at points of stress, points of triggers that really uh, culminate in a change. But also, a thing which is most important, I think, to understand Brazil, or to understand, or to establish differences among Latin American countries, or and the possibilities. And this, uh, and this is the fact that they, they call overlapping layers of history. Layers of uh, history or institutions which have been produced, they, they were dated and produced through a political dynamics, but they, they are still now part of another configuration, constellation of forces, and acquire a new meaning, but they are there. Corporatism is one, or this, this kind of thing, I think, paves the way to understand a bit better Brazil possibly to compare with India, but we don't have cases, but <laughs> Millet would call them the cases for sure. So 
uh, but coming back to watch the the watch the the, the historical institutionalism advances, but also with the help of rational choice. Uh, I think this kind, that's my, my belief, is that this kind of perspective uh, makes it much more, much clearer the mechanisms through which multiple causes act and interact to produce the more democratization or trend or confirm a trend to uh, autocratization. Uh, so I will go not not just to make a Two final points is, of course, I acknowledge that much depends how you construct your, your, your classification or your evolutionary pattern. Uh, it all depends much on the idea, the model of polity you have, which is the model of polity you, you are working with. Well, uh, I, I go with Hall, Peter Hall, uh, in a very recent piece, I think it was before, uh, published in 2016, so no recent, not recent, if you consider Trump and everything else. Uh, I wonder whether, in order to approach Latin America, differences, uh, and Brazil, uh, whether his way of approaching the model of polity he proposes as typical, which is ontological rather than theoretical only, uh, to acknowledge the means to embrace a model of, this means to, to acknowledge uh, or to embrace a model of polity that acknowledges the impact on political action of the social economic and political structure in which actors are embedded, and of course you are considering, at a particular time and place, and considering how events, that's my point, not, not only affect the outcome of interest, but also restructure the political and ideological setting in ways that condition the outcome and the decisions later on. And so that's where I would like to introduce a bit more my concerns when I think of Brazil. I jump now what I prepared, but I think that's important to make the point. Well, in recent times, all of us have been grappling with, uh, and I, I am a Hirschman's in Harry, I mean, I, I am a Hirschmanian in this way. All, he, when he wrote this piece, faced with uncertainty in Latin America, always looking at a bias for hope, looking, a bias for hope, looking for a bias for hope. Uh, when you think about, I think, of Brazil facing the threat we had to face, and are, are going to face, I think, uh, I think we must go back to a, no, a, no, a kind of word time which was shared with all Latin Americans, but in Brazil acquired a very special or inter, included a very special dimension. And this is the moment of the, of the, this is the moment of the ages where you have two two changes that were really shared by all Latin Americans. One was the crisis, the debt crisis, which in a way restructured the decision-making arenas in Brazil and everywhere, in different. You have the transition to democracy, which was very, very gradual. But you had another, the literature, the American literature, basically, dealt with the dual transition, economic liberalization and uh, political liberalization. I always, since times of Ampok is when we started, I started the politics and economics group, Brazil had a legal transition, had a constitution. 
and this is a unique case. Together with reshaping the arenas economically and politically, I don't go to, uh, that's my point, and I'm developing an NSA. Uh, you had a legal, not a legal, really legal, but a constitutional order, new constitutional order. So when I look now, I go back now, today, for to the time, we know, and re very recent research show that, that Brazil has a, a contribution to make to the literature on right-wing, right-wing, uh, uh, right-wing, not only movement, the characterization of uh, right-wing populism and more. Not only because the presence of military in the in the setting, which the other ones do not have, but basically because of the influence of the constitution. Uh, and I quote now a colleague who is both a political scientist and a, a very important lawyer, a professor of law, with his uh, Vilena, and all the research lawyers are doing or they show and this is all transdisciplinary approach, that Brazil, the Brazil right-wing variety of populism was uh, needed to resort to infralegal, uh, infra, infra, we say in English, infra, no, 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 uh, lower, lower, the, not, not changing institutions and constitutions except by a legal resorting to legal uh, to legal uh, toolkits that did not need or did not transpass the requirement of the constitution. And this in a very, very, very important way, I think that barred the Bart or makes a big difference in the way the right wing uh, could manage until now. Right? Because on the other hand, you, you have also a, um, political bases and alliances and coalitions which really does not do, are not something that may, may make us so sure that we barred. But the fact is that it is because the constitutions ensured a structure which you call consociationalism uh, agreement of the structure it, with such a number of vetoes meeting with the requirements of not only the parliamentary axis but the federative axis that Bolsonaro and his and his uh, um, and his associates would uh, had to resort to infra legal, and this is another variety of right wing populism. Apart the fact that we have military in the in the in the picture, and this, what I want to say with all that is that we there are moments where the, we can explain by trying to explain unique developments, we can make a contribution to the theory of the, how it is structured. And actually, what I, I think the, the important thing to, to, f to finish with is to say, well, actually, uh, Latin Americans, like all other industrializing or global south uh, countries, they the, the way they are inserted, or have been inserted in the global and the world time changes. Uh, world time changes are especially unsettling. So that, in the sense that it must, we must deal with quickly with all those challenges which you you put in the category of uh, uh, associated with the technological, etc., etc. But I think that we must work on the specificity of those kind of evolutions in a comparative way 
but trying to, even at risk of an imbalance between comprehension and generalization. There are moments when, especially because theorizing comes from the developed world in general. I remember when my students would read somebody said, whoa, uh, but this doesn't fit us. No, that's good, because it can explain them. We have an opportunity to make a contribution. So, I, but I think that there is this, this point, which is uh, perhaps we are, have clearer how unsettling and, and this should enter the category of how you classify. Uh, perhaps I don't want to, step to, to, to start a dialogue now, but in India you have reasons to believe that this unsettling may be controlled by the kind of state they may have and the kind of bureaucracy and so on. So it would go back to, so I finished. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the interesting conversation or comments and presentation as well. Um, given that we have two other presentations on the agenda for today, I don't think we have time for answering now, but hopefully in the end we have the opportunity to, for the presenters to respond to the comments. So thank you very much. We want to leave that all to the end, yes. <laughs> so then I would like to invite our next presenters to the stage, Lisa Sanotti and Carlos Melendez, as well as Camila Gorsha as a discussant. Okay, so, oops, sorry, it's very loud. Um, <laughs> so just briefly introduce you to the audience. So Carlos and Lisa were both also participants of that event that we had. Um, so this is an extra challenge. I have the bios in Portuguese. I do simultaneous translation now. <laughs> um, so both Carlos and Lisa are based at Universidad Diego Portales in Chile. Uh, Carlos is doctor of, uh, has, a, has a PhD in political science uh, from Notre Dame University, is professor at University Diego Portales, um, and also an affiliate researcher at the Democracy Institute of the Central European University. Um, and he has held numerous positions also as visiting professor and guest researcher around Latin America and other regions. Um, and has published numerous articles in various prestigious political science journals. And I uh, just want to mention his recent book um, called Post-Partisans, Anti-Partisans, Anti-Establishment Identifiers and A-Partisans in Latin America, uh, published with Cambridge University Press. So he focuses very much on topics of comparative politics, challenges to democracy, the rise of the right wing and the rise of populism. Um, Lisa Sanotti, um, I think, was until recently postdoc and is now assistant professor at Diego Portales University, right? Um, so, yeah, so she also holds a PhD in political science um, and specializes in political uh, comparative politics, um, more specifically in topics related to party systems. Uh, populism, radical politics of the right in Latin America and Europe, um, Eastern Europe, Western Europe, Western Europe, sorry, I'm always confusing Oriental, Occidental. <laughs> um, yeah, so she's also published numerous articles in various political science journals. And again, I just want to mention her most recent book titled um, or co-authored book, I think, titled Vox, The Rise of the Spanish Populist Radical Right, 
published with Routledge in 2021. And to my left, to your right, well, from your perspective, she's to the right. We had this little bit of thing going on during the conference, like the left and the right in the room, which of course depends on the perspective from where you sit. Um, but here we have Camila Rocha, who holds a PhD and also a master and everything else, I think, from the University of Sao Paulo who I haven't had the pleasure to meet so far, but her name popped up a lot when it came to all the debates about the rise of the right, the rise of right-wing populism in Brazil in particular. She, she has been involved in a number of research projects on this topic and published also on this topic. And she's now a researcher at Sebrapi. Um, don't ask me the correct English title, Center of Analysis and Planning, Brazilian Analysis and Planning, something like that. So a research center that's kind of affiliated with USP, but basically an independent research center. So I'm very happy to have all of you here and looking forward to your presentation and discuss and comments. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you, Brita, for the invitation. Thank you for the panel, for uh, for the organizations and institutions that organize this uh, conversation, actually seminar, in order to present an ongoing uh, work in progress that Lisa, Gonzalo Espinosa, Bianchi, and myself are working in a comparison about uh, the discourses of the right, especially of the far right. In not only in Latin America but also in in, in Spain, it, it, this is a work in progress about the rhetoric of the of the far right, based on Lisa will explain that based based on the recollection of a vast uh, number of uh, interviews and answers that far right politicians uh, have made in different uh, interviews. Uh, so, as as you know, uh, in the last uh, in the last years, the far right, the right, and especially the far right, have created, uh, have strengthened uh, a network, not only in Latin America but also with connections with the European far right, especially with Spain. So, um, Abascal, the leader of Vox, actually has employed uh, the, the use of this term Iberosfera in order to create um, this uh, 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 imaginary region <laughs> or of the, uh, of, of the organizations and the nations and the republics and, and the institutions that belong to the, uh, to the connections between Europe, actually, to the Iberic uh, part of, uh, of Europe and Latin America. But they have, he has employed this term at the other members of the, of, of the far right in order to create a distinction between the good and the bad members of this Iberosfera, right? Um, because, as you know, democracy globally is undergoing a process of erosion actually based or due to the challenge that the far right has, has created. Uh, the far right is a global phenomenon, quite recent in Latin America, but with, with various experience in, 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 in Europe. And, and as, you, as you can see in Latin America, it has a very specific particularities. But this is, these are the actors of the far right in the, this Iberosfera, right? You have uh, Javier Millet in Argentina, obviously Jair Bolsonaro in, in, in Brazil, Cast in Chile, Lopez Aliaga, the mayor of Lima in, 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 in Peru, Santiago Abascal and others, obviously. But what do they have in common? And specifically, what do they return to this? They re rhetoric have in in common. Actually, they talk a lot about. They speak a lot about communism, which is weird, right? Because we don't have like very strong political or communist political parties. Not only in, in especially in Latin America, communist political parties are relatively really weak. 
some exceptions, probably the Partido Comunista in Chile, but in general, the communist parties, even some socialist parties, not, not, not the case of Brazil, obviously, but the, but the communist parties are not that strong in, in our region. However, however, when the far-right politicians speak about freedom, which is a common word uh, used by these uh, pol politicians, they, try, they link the uses of freedom with anti-communism. Anti-communism is a negative partisanship very popular across the region, which is really interesting because in, in the last years we have seen a lot of uh, national uh, negative partisanships, like for example, anti-Bolsonarismo in Brazil, anti-Peronismo in, uh, in Argentina, anti-Fujimorismo in Peru. As you can see, there are many of other examples as well. But probably we have only one cross re uh, cross-national, regional, a negative partisanship, which is anti-communism. And in this case, the far right is employing anti-communism as a part of a re rhetoric, and especially as an ideological tool employed by the far right uh, with a noble fashion. This is not new in the history, obviously, of the political parties and the party systems in Latin America. But we have seen some new a new usage of this of this word, especially by the by the right, not necessarily the right the right in in Spain and other members of the Iberosphere of of the right. So we in in this in this work in progress we have we are uh, focus our research on the invocation of freedom that has become like an adaptive strategy in response to current global and progressive and regional trends, including, including obviously the reaction of the rise of the less weak population. If you make these uh, clouds of words of the speeches of regular uh, right-wing politicians, obviously freedom, libertad is everywhere, right? But our research uh, will demonstrate that these uses of freedom is not is obviously ar ar arbitrary because the far right tries to confront what they perceive as a cultural hegemony asserted by progressive and woke ideologies. So we are back to the cultural battle because this is the way that they, how they understand how the far right understand this binary opposition between them the the holders of the of their interpretation of the freedom against the rest, which I mean the progressive leftist uh, projects that are stigmatized as anti uh, as communist. They are stigmatized. They are created a perversion of the understanding of the uh, of of all social progressive. Uh, ideologues or, or uh, political, political, political projects. So we are studying this. We are studying the uses of the perversion of this cultural battle that they have employed in order to stigmatize and to uh, continue this mannequin and binary uh, uh, vision of the of the world. And in this case, the aim is the, is to contest and potentially reconfigure the ideological terrain. This is what the far right are, are doing, no, as, I'm, as I mentioned, not only in Latin America, but also in is, is, is Spain. So this is our um, uh, framework, our theoretical framework. This is the, the aim of our re research. And Lisa will uh, show the data that we have collected and some initial findings. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Thanks for having us. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, our data, our methods, and um, the very preliminary analysis uh, we, uh, we performed. So basically what we did is um, um, a classic uh, kind of uh, discourse analysis of just unstructured uh, discourse of um, these leaders that Carlos uh, mentioned before. Um, why we choose unstructured discourse? Because we feel it's more spontaneous. It's not prepared such as the um, structured discourse. 
uh, or um, uh, electoral programs. Um, basically, the plan is to analyze the discourse interview, basically, of seven leaders of the far right in the Eurosphere, uh, where Abascal from Vox in Spain, uh, Rafael López Aliaga uh, from, from Peru, uh, Javier Milei from Argentina, Jose Antonio Castro from Chile, uh, Javier, uh, Javier Bolsonaro from Brazil, and Andre Ventura from Portugal. Um, but for now, we just analyzed the data of the interviews of uh, three of the leaders, uh, Santiago Bascal, Javier Milei, and Rafael López Aliaga. We have now a data set which consists in, uh, I, I don't have the exact number, but like it's pretty just a, a big one, uh, 5,000 observation. And each observation is a response, an answer, uh, that uh, each one of these um, leaders gave to the interviews, interviewers. Um, and um, so we have the whole data set. And after cleaning, we have uh, around 5,000 uh, responses. OK. So basically, to perform this uh, discourse analysis, we use um, the model of GPT-4, uh, the, A the API. We basically consist let allow us to use the GPT-4 model um, and integrate it with uh, Excel to construct the, the database. And we wrote a prompt, which is an instruction uh, we gave to the model to basically analyze the discourse in terms of um, freedom frames and in terms of anti-communist rhetoric and basically uh, very briefly the, the the prompt consists in the question we ask the model um, the encoding uh, so which value the model uh, would assign to uh, every kind of freedom and uh, anti-communism reference to communism um, and the definition of of um, the kind of uh, types of freedom we, we use. Um, so basically, uh, we didn't use freedom as a like, um, standalone concept. We define freedom in, in three uh, kind of realms based obviously in uh, specialized um, literature. So we write freedom in personal autonomy, which basically is uh, liberal support for liberal uh, for individual freedoms uh, without the government uh, intervention uh, economic freedom which basically it represents or uh, um, is traduced with um, the support for minimal government intervention in the realm of the economy and civil liberties which are those liberties who are uh, basically protected uh, by constitutions so we have very, as I said, preliminary data. Um, and this is uh, the percentage of the responses of the discourse which address uh, the, three, uh, the three types of freedom. So we have here, uh, to me at least, the first surprise. Uh, I would think that Javier Millet uses the, the um, framing of freedom the most. Uh, but uh, it is actually not because uh, Santiago Pascal uses it like almost in the 50% of his discourse, which is a lot. Uh, and uh, um, Javier Millet is around 45%. Uh, and uh, we see that Rafael Lopez Aliaga, uh, it's like um, 20, a, a little more than 20%. So this is basically the same thing, but uh, divided uh, in the different kind of freedom, civil liberties, economic freedom, and personal autonomy. And the colors of are the, the leaders, the red is Javier Milei, the blue is Lopez Aliaga, and the green is Santiago Oscar. And here again, we can see um, differences. And the most striking difference, not surprising uh, to me, but like the, the main differences is that the, the Latin American leaders uh, tend to um, use more the uh, economic freedom um, uh, economic freedom frame let's say right here uh, we see the reference to communism 
And here again, another surprise, uh, Santiago Pascal is the one that refers the most to communism. This is um, uh, calculated in the, the totality of, of the responses. Um, so the 25% of uh, the discourse of Santiago Pascal refers to communism. Um, it's, uh, uh, Javier Millet is around 20%, maybe. Uh, and the reference to communism of uh, Rafael López Aliaga are minimum in comparison um, to the other two. Let's think that this is the whole discourse. I mean, there are like uh, many, many interviews. So uh, even though they seem like small percentages, they're really not. And here we filter basically uh, just the freedom discourse. So basically the blue part um, is, uh, I mean, the whole column in, is when they talk to about freedom, and the red part is when they combined freedom frames with communism. Here again, Santiago Pascal uh, is the one that combines the most the uh, freedom frames with communism. Then Javier Millet, they're pretty close. Uh, and uh, the one who does it the, the least is, is Rafael Pacella. Then to see like um, the tone, the sentiment they um, use when they talk about, um, the, the, this is about the, the whole responses, the, the calculated on the whole responses. So the general tone of their discourse here, not surprisingly, um, Javier Millet has the most negative um, tone uh, in the in the general discourse, and Rafael López Aliaga and Santiago Pascal are pretty similar uh, levels of uh, negative discourse. Um, but uh, the the thing that surprises me the most is that Javier Millet is the one who has uh, the the high percentage of positive discourse. Uh, and then we we did the same time but filtered when. The next one, yeah, when they use um, the reference to communism and when they, uh, when they don't. And here we can see that in general, um, they tend to uh, be more negative when they talk about communism, uh, the three of them. Uh, um, and they um, tend to be less positive when they talk about communism. So again, they're like very preliminary, um, results. Uh, we still need to incorporate uh, four more leaders. Um, so basically, what we're trying to to see is, first of all, if there are regional patterns. If um, we, we do know that Latin American uh, far right leaders tend to be more neoliberal than, in general terms, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm talking at least uh, more neoliberal than um, European, Western European um, far-right leaders. So uh, at least until now, with the data we have now, uh, we can confirm that. Um, and uh, there is the case of Rafael López Aliaga. Um, this is something I was thinking last night. Uh, in comparison with these two leaders, seems to refer much less to freedom because maybe um, we can uh, explain that uh, looking at the kind of peculiar far-right leader is a strong conservative um, religious uh, discourse, which is more collectivist, if we uh, can say that, than the other two. The other two um, are more, um, they rely more on individual kind of um, frames, um, rhetoric frames, when, when, they, um, when they refer to freedom and to uh, anti-communism too. Um, so I'm gonna stop here and let Camilla um, comment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah, without further ado, I hand over to Camilla for your comments and observations. Well, um, thank you, Carlos and Lisa, for the presentation. Thank you. Uh, Brita and Professor Jose for the invitation to to comment. Um, well, I think first of all, it's it's important to say that um, a lot of people that uh, work very closely to these uh, politicians 
uh, they they really um, let's say they, they they kind of participate of a, a network of intellectuals and policymakers that uh, see themselves as um, let's say libertarians or at least like very radical new liberal new liberals. So uh, for instance, for them, uh, the inspiration uh, in the, the Austrian uh, economists is very, very strong. So I, I think all this idea of what is communism, uh, for sure it's coming from, from there, from Hayek, from uh, von Mises, and, and et cetera. So for instance, uh, that's why uh, it's, not, it's not like, uh, okay, we don't have any more, we don't have the Soviet Union anymore, but we still have especially here in Latin America, we still have Cuba, we still have like Venezuela, like a, like a reference and like everybody knows what you're talking about when you talk about, okay, what, what is communism? Oh, it's, people say it's uh, dictatorship and hunger because they relate to, to what they think is those countries' uh, experiences. And well, besides that, I, I think that's, that's an element I think you you, you, you said something about it that's uh, equating uh, communism even with, uh, let's say, moderate left-wing parties, social democratic parties, human rights defenders, and um, even with, with uh, progressive new liberals, sometimes they're called communists, right? So I, I think that's the thing, you know, like it's, it's a very broad, uh, 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 let's say a um, uh, uh, signifier, right? So you can can put everything you 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 think is uh, like has a, a collective feel about it, like a, a like a communist flavor, a left wing flavor, something like that. And uh, and then you can say, okay, these are all bad people. These are our enemies, right? So you can create this uh, like this enemy discourse because we are the good guys and these are the bad guys and well, okay this this kind of rhetoric is, is really old right so you, you can like and even uh, even it's important to say that uh, for older people uh, they they really like this kind of, of of discourse makes them remind of the of, of past decades right when this when, when communist was really a thing. So, for instance, if you go to uh, Bolsonaro's uh, uh, protest in the street, you're going to see a lot of people that, okay, I, I recall, you know, I, I remember when, when communists were, when there were communists here in Brazil and everything. So I think this is, is it's an important thing also. And, um, well, I think that, like, when we think about uh, freedom, it's really interesting because um, if we think about uh, far right uh, discourses today, like you like you showed, uh, especially for Millet, right? Uh, they tend to be very negative, right? Like there there are few, uh, let's say, positive values, and I think like freedom is is one of them. Is a really like uh, a, a very and then it's difficult to, for, for I think for the for the left to you know to oppose right because are, are you going to be anti freedom no so it's a very powerful signifier right and um, I think like the 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 analysis you've you've already made it's it's really promising and. Um, I think the comments I will I will make for you is, is more like how uh, we would be able to refine it, how we would be able to. For instance, I was I was really curious about how Naibi Bukele would would fit in this analysis, right? Because uh, we just we just did a, a research now, like with with uh, five Latin American countries, including Brazil. And in all Spanish-speaking countries, all of them, all, all of the youth, and it doesn't matter left-wing, right-wing, like uh, 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 every, everybody liked Bukele. 
it, it, it's really a phenomenon. And I was, I was shocked, right, because El Salvador is a really small country and everything, but he, uh, he, he, he's a kind of um, influencer, right? So, so people really uh, got to know him and, and really liked him. Even, even uh, young people that would define themselves as, as the left wing, they would like him because they would say, oh, okay, this guy, he solved the, 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 the crisis, the security crisis, the, the, you know, in, in El Salvador. So uh, here in our countries, we could, do, we could do the same. And I'm not, of course, <laughs> it's, it's highly polemic. I'm not, I'm not, of course, human rights and everything. And people, people would even say, oh, okay, we know that he did a lot of, like, polemical things or bad things, but he solved it. That, that's what was the perception. Do you understand? So, and what I'm, what I'm, why am, uh, am I saying this? Because, um, well, what I, what I tried to do here is to, like, um, let's say, be more uh, specific about, for instance, when, when we, when you have this freedom discourse, first, I think we, you can have uh, uh, two targets at the same time. One is for the elites, so for local elites and also for global elites. So, for instance, um, Javier Millet. Uh, I think, for instance, uh, local elites and global elites probably uh, supported him in, in various aspects of, of what he was saying. Uh, I mean, regarding the economy. It, it was not, oh, okay, we don't know, we don't want this guy and everything. No. Maybe if he was like a, a, how is it? a, a, a left-wing populist, it would be worse, right? <laughs> so I think that's one thing. And the other thing, I think it, there is this uh, target uh, related to like regular people, right, like, like the, the, the voters. And then when we look to the voters, and for the past five years, <laughs> I, I talked to a lot of, a lot of voters, uh, regarding uh, the economy, freedom uh, stands for not paying taxes. And of course, who wants to pay taxes, right? So it's, it's really popular. Uh, being able to be hired uh, without labor rights. So, for instance, for Uber drivers and for uh, this, this kind of precarious jobs, like people are in such a deep <laughs> crisis that they accept to work for this, uh, this kind of uh, companies. And um, they, they really fear that if there are labor regulations, they, would lo they will lose their jobs. So that's one kind of thing that you know, like, okay, I want, I want this, the, I want to be, be free to be able to, to work without uh, having labor rights. And um, there is also here in Brazil, um, it's really like when when you when you go when you talk to people that live in uh, places that um, have like natural uh, resources exploitation. Um, it's really like people are, are really totally for Bolsonaro because Bolsonaro uh, is for, for their freedom to exploit nature at their will without respecting any regulations. So this discourse of freedom and, and, and freedom from even from uh, the state's regulation is really strong am amongst them. So that's also another way that it resonates. But I don't know about, about other countries, for instance, if, if this is present or not, but I know that in Brazil it's, it's, it is present. And, well, I think beyond economy, there is, I, I think there are other aspects uh, related to, to this freedom uh, discourse that, for instance, uh, in Latin America, uh, the, the whole uh, security <laughs> issue is, is really like a, a thing that really uh, um, uh, preoccupies people, right? So, for instance, this, this 
uh, freedom uh, for owning a gun to defend yourself. This is like really strong in Brazil. I don't know, maybe in other countries too. But for instance, in, in El Salvador, like, okay, now, now uh, Bukele locked everybody, and uh, finally we are able to walk in the street without being attacked, being robbed, so we, we have this freedom, you know, freedom to, to not being robbed, not being attacked, not being. Uh, another thing, I think that the, the pandemic also had a very um, strong effect regarding this, this discourse about freedom, because uh, people, especially uh, young people, uh, really felt like, I, you know, this is not right, that I cannot leave my house, that I cannot uh, work, that I cannot go out uh, without wearing a mask. You know, this is kind of, uh, quote, totalitarian uh, thing. So I think that especially for, for uh, Javier Millet, I really have a strong hypothesis that uh, it, it, it's, it, it correlates with his, you know, extension, this, this, all this, this freedom uh, discourse regarding like what, what you were able to do or not during the, the pandemic. And um, well, also, that's what I know about uh, uh, here in Brazil, but I don't know also about the other countries, but uh, we also have like a, a lot of people that are religious, uh, especially uh, Christian evangelicals, that they relate freedom to the freedom to profess their religion, uh, regardless of ethical or human rights, uh, uh, this human rights agenda, right? So, okay, I, it's my uh, my freedom to say that I don't uh, that I don't think uh, gay people are are uh, I don't know like um, uh, will be accepted for uh, for God or some, 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 something like that, you know, like um, I and I think that. Uh, for instance, this is this is really um, strong in Brazil. Strong in Brazil, and, and it, it has, um, it, it, like you said, this let's say freedom of speech. It relates to this freedom of speech, but it it's a specific kind of it, right? Because it has this religious uh, component, and I think this idea of freedom of speech is really powerful, uh, especially amongst young people. And uh, finally, I think there is, um, I think in, in, in Argentina we saw that, for, at least, that uh, this discourse of freedom, freedom regarding the, let's say, the poli political capture uh, of the state uh, uh, by, by, by Kirchnerismo, Peronismo, and, and so on. So this, this perception that uh, we don't we don't uh, live in a republican free state and everything because everything is captured and, and you know and, and it's not it's not a perception that it's that distant from reality. But you know I think it, it, they also uh, relate to this. And I think finally, what I would say is that maybe uh, we can try to understand this, uh, let's say, right-wing libertarianism or far-right uh, libertarianism, like a, a reactionary libertarianism, right? Because it's, it's always like, um, it's my right to go against uh, what society thinks is good, even if, if it's going to eventually do some, ha some harm, but, you know, but it's my right above all. So I don't know, I think we, there, there are a lot of things that we can still think about it, but I, I really um, like the, the, the work you did and really uh, anxious to see the results. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Great um, presentation, great comments. Um, I'm a bit worried about time, <laughs> so I think as with the uh, presentation before, we need to move on and then hopefully in the end we have some time for you to react or for some further questions from the audience. So thank you so much.
Um, and I'll now call the final round for this afternoon, the final team, so to say, um, to the stage, with, uh, which is Tom Legler and Maria Arminia Tavares de Almeida. Wherever you like. <laughs> we do have also the... Well, do you want to sit here? No, no. <laughs> All right, so brief presentations once again, simultaneously translating. <laughs> um, so Professor Thomas Legler uh, is a professor at Universidad Iberoamericana uh, in Mexico, Mexico. Um, and he specializes in international relations and comparative politics, so very much at, on topics at the intersection between these two fields, if you want, um, including politics and development in Latin America, um, regional organizations and hemispheric organizations, such as the Organization of American States and the Inter-American System more broadly, multilateralism uh, in Latin America and regional governance. Um, and he's also worked a lot on the question of democracy and promotion and protection of democracy by regional institutions um, in Latin America and also in comparative perspective. Um, and um, he's also a member of the Sistema Nacional de Investigadores in Mexico. Um, and to my left here, I have Professor Maria Emilia Tavares de Almeida, who is uh, or who was a professor at both at the Department of Political Science and the International Relations Institute here at USP, whose director she also was for several years. Um, and currently, she's a senior researcher at SEBRAPI, the same institute where Camilla is also based. Um, and she has coordinated numerous research projects in political science and international relations and working particularly on public policies, political institutions, um, Brazilian politics, uh, public opinion, and also Brazilian foreign policy. Um, and so, of course, she has numerous publications, including a co-edited volume with Gianluca Gardini, Latin American Responses to the Rise of Brazil, to mention just a few selected examples. So I'm very happy to have the two of you here. Um, and the same model as before, Tom will give his presentation and then I will hand over to Maria Minia for some comments and observations. Thank you very much. Britta, uh, thank you very much to the Institute of Advanced Studies and USP. Uh, I'm delighted to be here again. Um, and of course, I'm thrilled to have Dr. Tavares de Almeida as my uh, discussant. So I'll try to rush through this. Um, just a little bit of background here autobiographically. Um, just like Britta, I've been working for many years. In fact, it's my oldest line of research on um, democracy, regional democracy protection. Um, so I stumbled upon this because, uh, as I'm sure is the case in many, uh, for many people here, uh, there's a collective sense of frustration that uh, these regional, regional instruments that were developed to uh, promote and defend democracy just have not been doing the job. And of course, there's a growing volume of literature on why is it that uh, these tools from the Organization of American States, uh, UNESCO at, at its time, and other regional organizations just have not been working. And well, we, we stumbled upon this one particular aspect, which is uh, the role of a particular, and some would say a new, a new set of, of leaders across the region, autocrats. Um, and they deserve for their agency to be taken quite seriously in, in terms of the problematic of how to defend democracy using regional or international tools and actors, right? Now, just, I just want to clarify something here. Um, no, um, Viktor Orban and Jaroslav uh, Kaczynski are not honorary Latin Americans. 
They are on this slide because um, this uh, this presentation is part of um, a work in progress, a, a, a an initiative, a research that I'm collaborating with my dear friend and colleague uh, Peter Birle from the Inter-American Institute, Ibero-American Institute in Berlin. So that research is comparative cross-regional. So I've kept that in because I think it does underscore uh, a lot of the points that I want to make. Is it? Okay, just very, very quickly, um, let's just fly through this. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about my, the research parameters that we have. Um, this notion, central notion of autocrats playbook that I want to get across. And what are the plays in this playbook? Um, and compare a little bit, very briefly, the play selection that these autocrats have used um, in their attempts to uh, shape international public opinion uh, and to thwart uh, international regional efforts to defend democracy in Latin America or Europe. Okay. Uh, so yeah, just just that point. Uh, this uh, the set of uh, leaders, illiberal leaders, opportunistic leaders, um, have been quite adept at thwarting both efforts in in Latin America and on in the case of the European Union in um, in the European context. Uh, so there there has been a rise of references both in, in the popular media and in a growing number of uh, academic sources to this idea of an auto, autocrat's playbook. So that's that's at the center of our research. We're, we're trying, what we're trying to look at is, is that there's not just a common set of domestic plays here, which there's been a lot of efforts, but we need to pay attention to and we need to recognize uh, that there are a number of international plays in this playbook and, and, and these affect uh, domestic outcomes in terms of the political struggles uh, or contests between these autocrats and their political opponents and, and the electorate. Uh, there's, a, there's a sense that somehow these are different from more classic um, autocrats or dictators. Uh, I, I would say there's a mix of, there's continuity and change in this, right? Um, as we can say in particular in the Latin American case, I'll come to that in a minute. But there's reference to spin dictatorships, you know, this idea of spin doctors, that they um, they really know how to take the pulse of, of uh, their electorates and of societies. Uh, they resonate. Um, they, they know how uh, to use political communications very effectively. Um, they're most, Moises Naim has called them 3P autocrats, so that's populism polarization and post-truth. Um, I'm going to fly through this. I think, I think we're familiar with a lot of the, the, their characteristics. Okay, this idea of autocrats playbook, I'm sorry it's somewhat US-centric, uh, but it's a, an American football reference. Uh, I'm sorry if there's a lot of people here who don't, who don't understand the rules of American football, but basically uh, each team uh, resorts on a set of plays when it's in position of the ball, uh, it, when it holds possession of the ball, rather, uh, to try to get that ball downfield and score a touchdown, right? So uh, in a similar sense, I think this metaphor has been, been applied to these autocrats that have a growing selection of plays that they can use um, both in a domestic context, but also vis-a-vis -vis, uh, international actors that... Uh, might attempt to defend democracy against them or or to influence international public opinion. So we've tried to give a bit of a, a definition here, a shared action repertoire of domestically and internationally oriented techniques, tactics, and strategies that are used by autocrats to promote autocratization and or their own perpetuation in power. Um, emphasis here on the concept of action repertoire. So this should probably bring some deja vu to mind. This is, uh, we're using this in an analogous sense to how it's used in the social movement literature, right? That um, that this is a, this playbook is comprised of a set of plays that perhaps originally were used, or, or strategies that were originally used in one particular context and are, are diffused in an international way such that 
other autocrats in completely different contexts pick up these, these plays, either adopt them or adapt them to their, to their local contexts. So uh, analogous to this idea of a collective action repertoire, I know that's something that's a particular collective action tactic can start out in one country and, and before you know it um, can be diffused globally. Okay, um, so autocratic survival uh, against both domestic and international opposition or criticism it, it creates an imperative for tactical innovation, adaptability, and learning. So there are some old plays, just like there is in American football, that, that teams go to over and over again. But there are new plays that, of course, confuse uh, opponents and confuse um, would-be defenders of democracy internationally because they haven't seen them before, right? Um, so we can say in an analogous sense to social movement theory as well that, that we're looking at um, an evolving global political opportunity and constraint structure that also shapes the strategies that autocrats use domestically against their, their political opponents and and vis-a-vis -vis the electorate. Okay. Um, so as I, as I said briefly before, um, so far the emphasis in a lot of this uh, growing literature has been on domestic plays. So how, how, they, how democracy dies, to, to borrow um, uh, Levitsky and Sieblatt's uh, title of their book, it, this idea of that they all they, there's a common set of strategies that use they use domestically. What we're saying is we need to expand that playbook to, to acknowledge that there's a lot of strategies that are perhaps equally important in terms of uh, gaining international support and minimizing the, the abilities of international actors to defend democracy against them. Um, so, and from our perspective of trying to think about how uh, regional efforts can be enhanced or strengthened to defend democracy. Uh, we need to acknowledge this to some degree, potentially, as the counterpart of the multilateral democracy protection toolkit at the disposal of regional organizations such as the OAS and the European Union. Okay, so very quickly, uh, Peter Birlen and myself, we, we perused uh, uh, fairly broad literature to, to come up with a, a set of plays that uh, were present either in the European context or the Latin American context or, or even in some other context um, like Asia so with some references. Um, so just going down the list very quickly, um, the manipulation of international election monitoring has become uh, a tool across different contexts and precisely in uh, the workshop that we were in yesterday, uh, Britta and uh, Giovanni Agustinis uh, made reference to uh, of how, uh, in the context of UNASUR, this new um, electoral accompaniment at, at its time was, uh, was a tool that could be used in the hands of governments such as Vene uh, that of Venezuela to um, appear to be um, inviting electoral observation, but controlling that electoral observation for uh, manipulating for their own uh, internal purposes. Foreign lobbying, I don't think much needs to be said on that. Uh, rallying around the flag, uh, this idea of uh, in, in the face of international criticism, obviously, um, uh, bringing out the flag, um, invoking nationalism against uh, some particular um, perceived uh, regional opponent or international opponent, whether that's the European Union, it's Eurocrats, or, it, or it's the OAS controlled by, by the evil Yankees and so forth. Um, international disinformation campaigns, uh, post-truth, um, don't think much needs to be said about that. Uh, pleas to national security, um, perhaps that's an older play in the book. Uh, willingness to dialogue game, uh, we can see this in cases like Nicaragua in, in Venezuela, uh, over and over again, um, when uh, when they're against the wall, these these leaders very briefly uh, seem to indicate a, a willingness to to dialogue, 
uh, and to negotiate. Uh, but in many cases, this is, this is just buying time to reposition and eventually gain an upper hand. And surprise, surprise, uh, little or no fruits are gained uh, uh, in terms of uh, agreements or, or the like. Um, the blame game. Uh, identifying external actors as the source of, of problems or source of evil, whether that's the Eurocrats or, or, it's, or it's the United States with its economic war against Venezuela and so forth. Um, contested multilateralism, forum shopping and membership withdrawal. What does this mean? Well, creating uh, other institutions regionally, um, thereby excluding uh, actors or using those other existing regional organizations. Um, so in the case of actors like Venezuela, um, trying to divert from the OAS to CELAC, for example. Um, OK, and membership leveraging. This is something more in the European context that we've seen with Hungary, for example. That's um, despite growing uh, pressure from the European Union um, against the Hungarian regime, the Ukrainian uh, war arises, uh, providing an opportunity for Hungary um, to, um, to push uh, the European Union to weaken its pressure, uh, democracy protection pressure, um, in exchange for Hungary's support uh, for um, raising money or, or supp supplying assistance to, to Ukraine. Um, and autocratic international. This is the idea that uh, of autocracy protection. I think far beyond autocracy promotion, uh, that there's a growing club of uh, of uh, countries that um, are privately providing each other with uh, important symbolic uh, and material support uh, against uh, the democracy protectors or against international public opinion. It's, very, very hard to see this. Uh, but what we did basically here is we went country by country to see uh, with the autocrats and the autoc if the uh, part these particular plays that I just spoke about um, were, were present in, in, in these respective countries. Uh, I'd really like to leave time here for, for questions for and comments. Um, but what you can see is it basically two sets of patterns. Uh, some patterns where we see a, a play, such as the, the last play here, Autocratic International, which seems to be pertinent across the different regions. In other plays, we see that they're more region specific. So we have, um, in the first three columns, we have El Salvador, Nicaragua, and Venezuela. Uh, so we see, for example, Pleas to National Security, um, have been a, a common play that they've that the autocrats have used in those those three contexts, or vice versa in the uh, European Union context. Uh, there may be some that are a little bit more prevalent. Okay. So conclusions. Um, uh, we're convinced that there we can speak about this autocrats playbook in the sense of a, of an action repertoire that is shared. And, and whose plays are diffusing international among these autocrats. Uh, there are both common and contrasting patterns of play selection in each region. Uh, and that this evolving differential political opportunity structure affects play selection in each region. Uh, that it is important uh, for us to bring autocrat agency into the study of the limits of regional organization democracy protection in both regions, uh, that democracy protection has been accompanied by the rise of autocracy protection. And that's not accidental. It's very interactive. It's uh, very dialectic, if you will. Um, and regional multilateral democracy protection strategies must take autocrats' playbooks very seriously. Innovate and update accordingly. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, to Moises and Brita, who have uh, invited me and given me the opportunity of being here, of discussing your presentation. Thomas, I enjoyed a lot the, the PowerPoint. I, I 
you see, you send me. Uh, I'm not very good in improvising, so I, I, I'll talk about some, I, some ideas that uh, I had when I, uh, yeah, uh, when I saw and I read your, your, your PowerPoint, I think you bring a very important uh, issue to discussion of, of uh, new populism, autocracy, etc. That is to say, the international dimension, and uh, I think you do it very in a very interesting way. If I understood you, uh, in, in a matter of fact, a playbook is a set of values, repertoires, and strategies uh, that uh, leaders, uh, autocratic leaders, use in order to to uh, to make their point and defend their, 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 their interests. And I think that you're, you're, it's very interesting that you focus on the international dimension, uh, but we must take in consideration that there is also a domestic playbook and there is an interplay between the two, the, 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 the two playbooks. And and especially, uh, there are domestic use of international uh, positions of international uh, international um, issues by the the, the, the populist leaders, uh, which is uh, which is it's important to 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 understand because it's domestic, uh, for instance. The importance that have been given to Venezuela and Cuba in the in the in the domestic political discussion has not any relations to the importance of Venezuela and Cuba to the foreign policy of Brazil. But that was one of how to say marcadores, one of the the issues that the divide the 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 pro uh, a pro popular right wing populist and an opposition and so i think uh, although your focus is is, is okay I, I think you, we all we always have to to ha take into into consideration how this plays domestically and why some some themes uh, some uh, some uh, topics of the repertoire uh, uh, Come to 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 gain in importance. They are important not only to in order to to rethink the position of of the the country in the international uh, system, but they are instrumental to the domestic political uh, uh, political discussion. And so I think that some time in your in your your research you should take in, into consideration the two. Uh, Play uh, 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 playbooks, uh, and on the other hand, uh, have, I think about Brazil mostly because I, I know I know better. Uh, but for instance, there has been an effort uh, to to redefine the the Brazil identity. Uh, through a new interpretation of the position of Brazil and this history of uh, uh, of Brazil in international in the international system, the, our first former minister of foreign relations thought that we belong to a tradition that came from the Crusades, and we are the, <laughs> you are the uh, you are the the heroes of that uh, 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 that protect a, a kind of uh, Tradition, uh, Western tradition, and therefore uh, uh, Hungary was a very important, <laughs> very important part of this. Although our relations to Hungary are, uh, are not that in, uh, that important actually in in in, in foreign policy, there's a, a, a series of of. Uh, of, uh, of streaming in the, in the right wing streaming is called Parallel Brazil. They reconstruct 
the, the history of Brazil, beginning with this, our, our international tradition coming from the Greeks and then the Middle Ages and then et cetera, et cetera. And so I think it's important. This is a rep, this is international repertoire, but this is a, rep, a repertoire that has to do with the construction, the building of the uh, political identity inside, inside the country. Um, I think you, you in your, uh, w w another question that could be interesting, and, uh, well, how this come about, okay? Uh, and we can think about two, two possibilities, and they are, I think they are, they are not uh, excluded, they, are, they don't exclude each other. The first is you have political diffusion, as you had Keynesianism, as you had neoliberalism. Now you have some kind of political diffusion of this repertoire. That's not an arbitrary repertoire. That's not a domestic repertoire. You have some kind of uh, uh, some process of uh, of diffusion of this. And on the other hand, you have this is is based on um, real, actual networking, because it's, it's not, it, it comes through the, the participation in IPEC and uh, conservative uh, congresses and, and, and meetings, etc., etc. You you call the attention to this second uh, dimension of of the of this issue: the networking, the link linkages. Uh, Etc. But uh, maybe we could try to explain how this come about. We should also introduce the idea of the uh, of diffusion. And finally, I have two more 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 observations. It's not an observation to your work, but they they, they came to my mind. Uh, Looking at your your PowerPoint, uh, the, I, I think that maybe the choice of tools or the emphasis in the, this repertoire in in, in international scale uh, have to do with different contexts uh, in terms of the. For instance, the capacity of the regional actors and institutions to to contain and to to influence the the what ha is happening here and influence the the, the governments, the, the right wing governments, right wing populist governments, and of course maybe you could explore a little bit more the difference between being in Latin America where. The constraining capacity of regional institutions are very low with Europe, since you are studying Hungary and Poland and, 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 and Hungary and Poland, uh, where you have the European Union, which much more uh, tools uh, to to, to constrain, to press, etc. Yeah, I think you could develop a little bit more, and yeah, I think it's uh, it, it, it's really. Could be could be interest interesting. On the other hand, there's a kind of non-institutionalized pressure that is also important, and maybe you you should take uh, in, into consideration. Uh, when Brazil began to burn the Amazon <laughs> in in the beginning of uh, of the yeah, Bolsonaro's government, European pressure was important to contain. The government had to to explain that they were not doing that, that was uh, a lie, that Macron was creating a, a kind of, uh, of um, lie about what happening uh, in Brazil. That is to say, uh, they had to take into consideration uh, the the uh, the pressure, and on the, uh, the other on the other hand, we know uh, that pressure of the United States government 
during the after during the elections and after the elections was very important uh, to uh, to cajole <laughs> the military uh, to uh, to uh, to fulfill the institutional role. So there are also uh, uh, forms of constraining that are not embedded in international in international institutions, and maybe uh, this could be interesting to to explore. And finally, I think that uh, the international behavior. Of, of those governments uh, may be, be have a relation, they may be, be related to their, each country's relations to the, what we call uh, the liberal international order institutions. Uh, one thing that Brazil has a, a very long tradition of multilateralism and of having active participation in international organizations. Under the, 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 the Bolsonaro's government, what they have do was continue. They continue to participate. They didn't deny the, the importance of multilateral uh, organizations, but they tried to change the, the, the alliances, the coalitions, they participate. For, I, I just give you an example. In the, uh, in the Council of Human, Human, Human Rights Council, where the Brazil always had some kind of, uh, of, uh, of participation, they turned to, uh, to ally to Saudi Arabia, Hungary, etc., and all the countries that, and they uh, began to uh, to try to censor, to to impose censorship in documents regarding human uh, human rights, uh, gay rights, and etc. So uh, uh, maybe it depends on the on the previous experience and the previous commitment of the country to participation in international relations, what those governments do when they, uh, uh, when they must uh, deal with, uh, with these international institutions. That's all. Thank you so much for your, uh, for your presentation and for your PowerPoint. Thank you so much to both of you, Maria, Minia, Tom, and yeah, I'm not quite sure what to do now because we <laughs> yeah, I was thinking about that. So, so I just wanted to quickly give the audience. I know we are probably all tired, but <laughs> nevertheless, um, I wanted to give the opportunity to ask if there are questions from the audience. And meanwhile, um, while you're gathering maybe your ideas. I would like to invite all the presenters to come back on stage so that we'll have a final round of answers, comments. Okay. Okay, so there is a question. I'll just walk around here with the microphone and Um, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for the presentation. My question is for, is for Carlos. Uh, so I'm. Uh, let me present myself first. So my name is Maria. I am a PhD candidate at the Department of Political Science. And me too. I work with. Oh my God. <laughs> me too. I work with right wing populism, as as I call it and extreme right discourse. So I'm actually very interested in your method, or, uh, especially in your method. And I was especially intrigued by the fact that you came from the idea of freedom and anti-communism as being some of the central aspects of right-wing discourse. So I'm asking myself, uh, why? Where did that come from? Is that because of Bob's perspective on right wing as the right being more, uh, more clo uh, 
closer to the issues of freedom and the left to egalitarianism. So that's one that that's a point. Why did you why did you choose freedom as the central aspect? Is that something you first you came to the, the to your primary fonts, to your primary material, the discourses themselves, and then you said, oh, so here I have the centrality of freedom, so now I'm going to work with this. Or is this something that came before even working with the material? So why was that choice made? And was it tested with the data? Did you go to the data and you ask chat GPT or something? Is, this an, is, is it a central aspect of right-wing populism in different in different circumstances because I'll in my in my work I wouldn't say that is central to Bolsonaro for instance I don't find that especially when I work with his with his discourses when he was a deputy and not the president before he got closer to Paulo Guedes and many many liberals so I, I think that's my question is it really central did you did you find that after looking at your data or before looking at your data? And I'm really curious about your method. Is ChatGPT really useful for that? Did it clarify things for you? I'm really curious, really, really curious. Thank you so much. Thank you. Wow, one more question over there. I'm going to. And we have another some some more people here, so I give you the mic later on. So yes, I will. I'm going to be very concise. First, first, uh, I don't know. I was listening. Uh, I find the uh, the uh, the research and the empirical methodological and empir empirical aspect of your research on the relation between freedom and communism, but, or anti-communism. But at the same time, I was thinking, well, what's new about it? You know, when you go back to 1960s, 1970s, you know, basically the Cold War discourse, you know, trying to oppose a freedom and communism was very, very, very frequent. You know, remember what, 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 what was the name of that radio station in Europe? You know, that was uh, uh, that was uh, transmitting towards the uh, communist country at the time. It was called Radio Free Europe. You know? So I would like to know what's the difference between that old Cold War opposition between freedom and communism and what we find now in the discourse of those right-wing leaders in this case in Latin America. Aaron, I would like you to explain. I didn't get, I followed with a lot of interest your presentation. However, however, I didn't get the relation between your last slide and the rest of the presentation when you were talking about the, uh, the, the new uh, type of big companies. So there was a link that I probably missed, but I would like you to explain it better. And uh, I don't know, Tom, I found it very interesting, but I think that, yes, it's important. I think that Maria uh, Herminia Tavares uh, was right when she was saying that maybe you would it would be interesting to try to strengthen the link between domestic and international politics in those cases and very interesting to use Sydney Taro and apply it to the field of international relations <laughs> okay well thank you for the presentations very briefly, in the case of the coding, I guess that maybe one way to expand more is to create some descriptors that will present other parts of their speech. Because when we something that that keeps in the in the in the in the mindset of voters 
is when, for instance, Trump says a, 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 a sleepy joke, <laughs> or when Millet a, a somehow makes derogatory comments about the Pope. You know, so those, uh, those, uh, uh, descript if you create perhaps some descriptors about uh, derogatory comments or, 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 or sometimes eroding institutions, perhaps that will tell us more somehow how they are driving the agenda in terms of uh, shaping public opinion. And I guess you have an endless <laughs> universe of uh, areas to win that direction, but I guess adding other descriptors it would enrich a little bit the, the, the discourse analysis of the, of the right and the left. You know? <laughs> and um, in, the, in the case of Aaron, it's also along the same lines. And in, in your final quadrant, and, and later, let's say that that transition that we are facing, it, what is the, the, uh, in that quadrant the, the, the combination that will be better equipped to deal with that uh, a transition that you mentioned regarding information, you know, all the companies. And so in your view, let's say the ideal type, what would be the one that could somehow address a better that, uh, a, that technological transition? And Tom, I, I guess that, I mean, you, you expanded, you know, the, the, the playbook of uh, Snyder and all this literature, and I guess, is, is good because I, I, I found it more, uh, more comprehensive, perhaps. And, and, and perhaps another way, another avenue could be to go before, uh, beyond the, the right, also apply to the left. So it seems that this playbook is also used by other political positions, you know, and I guess that expands more. That is not coming, only coming from the right. It's even coming from the left and other uh, political avenues. Thank you. Uh, thank you, you all, for the, your presentations. I just have a brief question to Carlos and Lisa. I was wondering about, further than the aspects that you analyze of the discourses, if do you see any type of changing in the political representation of the places that you find out of these leaders? If there is a, any pattern that you see that is uh, perhaps being more aligned towards uh, strengthening the political representation in those places, or is basically uh, shaping new other ways of representation. That's all. Thank you very much. Aaron, I, I, maybe I'm wrong because I, I tried to to, uh, to ask uh, Lourdes about your last um, table, and she didn't have. But I, you have coalitions like this, elite, elite. You have <coughs> modern elites and uh, and. Uh, Workers and on that you have traditional elites or and and lower middle classes. But when you think about bolsonarismo, you what you have a very different thing about. You have uh, modern financial etc. elites, but you have also uh, a very modern um, agricultural sector and. I would say lower, mid, lower, middle classes that are not losing anything. They actually have grown uh, during the, the previous, uh, pre previous period, you see? Because sometimes uh, is the, the left uh, coalition is a kind of, well, those that, that were, were lost something, those losers of the, of the process. While I think that here, what we have seen is not a coalition of losers. It's a coalition of people who have gained, and well, uh, they they read their gaining in another with uh, or in other ways different from from ours. Yeah, I think we have to wrap up now, given time and so basically each of you now has one minute <laughs> to, to respond uh, to the questions that were raised so should should we start go in the order of presentations and start with Aaron I don't know if the other micros are working just check otherwise you get this one um, so one minute obviously not enough time to answer and is but but mostly a, a big thank you to, to Lourdes for very extensive comments, and, and 
I won't try to answer all of them. I think I will pick one. Uh, and so the one observation that I that I really liked of yours, and that I that I will draw out more, is the observation that, uh, and I think you were making the point that is true about Brazil and many places in Latin America, that there there are these legacies of history that are sort of held over. And I think that that's absolutely the case, and it's especially the case in the international periphery. You get new insertions into the international economy, but they don't fully replace the old. And this is this has been a defining characteristic of you know the, the the periphery. So that legacy of history, I think, is absolutely part of the story here, which is that you know as the left side of my quadrant you know emerges, it can't displace the right. That's why we get some of these very strange coalitions. And, I, and, and, and to be more clear, you're right, the, the appeal that is made is not on the basis of being a loser. It's Bolsonaro's appeal is on the basis of being the right kind of Brazilian. And the wrong kind are now invading your spaces, right? Invading your universities, invading your airports. And so that was the, that was the story, is that you, you used to have a great life, and now it's been diluted and watered down and all the, the privileges that came with being the right kind of citizen have been you know dispersed so uh, great question and and I need to I mean this is two papers that I you know, squished together but um, uh, you know to, to both of your questions about well yours was sort of what's the right coalition I don't, I don't know that I, I mean I have, I have my own political preferences but I do believe that there are, there are different options. So this get, gets to your point about contingency. There are different ways in which, especially developing countries, might respond to this moment. And uh, now I'm going to do some shameless. This book just was published uh, last two weeks ago uh, by the Usiteki Editora uh, here in, in Brazil. It's going to come out in Spanish with Universidad Costa Rica and in in uh, U.S. with Uni University of New York and uh, it deals with a lot of these questions, which is, you know, what are the options facing developing countries as they, you know, face a increasingly distant technology frontier for developing countries, for working classes? How do they respond? Because new rents are now available, and yet none of them are going to those those two, you know, those two actors. And so I think that this that that is the question. One of the coalitions would be one that might include those actors more in a more likely way. That, that neo-developmentalist left side of then not an accident, it's on the left, you know, that left side of incorporating lower classes. And and their response to this moment is say, well, if you don't give universal education and universal health care, then you're leaving out, you don't know when the next Einstein is going to be. You don't know where the person, you know, you have to provide that in order to bring everybody into this new economy so that they can participate in this knowledge economy. The other option, the you know the the neoliberal plus exclusionary option, says this is about hoarding you know uh, 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 hoarding resources and putting them in the hands of those who are going to invest in high tech. You know, so exclude everybody else; they don't matter. What we have to do is focus on the clusters and the actors and the ones who are the innovators. And if they're you know leaving others behind, so be it. You know. So they're, they're very different responses. I have my own political preferences. I don't. I, I actually don't know if one is going to be better, right? It takes a lot of money to do that universal thing and 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 pull it off. Um, so there may be places that will show, you know, impacts. I think Modi's India is is that coalition, right? A conservative economic policy and an exclusionary, you know, electoral strategy and. They're betting on just investing in the people that they need to invest in. Um, I'm sorry. That was... Let's continue with Carlos and Lisa. Then. Uh, briefly, uh, when you look at the cloud of words about the speeches of political leaders, freedom is uh, frequently one of the most used words. That's why we we chose to study freedom, and it was before, but after that, after that. The use of the GPT, uh, Lisa will explain that much better. We also turn, uh, it turns out that uh, effectively, this is the word that is most employed by the right wing leaders. And that's why we decided to link with another word, which is uh, communism, which is not new, obviously, it's not new. But as you mentioned, which is new is that the Cold War ended 30 years ago. 
So why they are still em 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 employing that? So we need evidence. Uh, actually, we are more empirical driven political scientists. So uh, there's no much uh, evidence rese uh, research on the use of communism and anti-communism in, in political science. So that's why we are planning to, to choose, for example, political leaders that has gone through the Cold War and has survived to the, to the, to, to the present, like, for example, Mario Vargas Llosa. This is a, he actually he, uh, was the leader that founded this movement, Libertad, in the 80s, in the, in, in the Cold War. And now he's been, uh, he's been sub supporting right-wing political candidates and, until now. So it will be really interesting to, 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 to trace the use of uh, freedom and communism in one leader through, throughout this, this period. And to, uh, uh, your question is really important about the political representation because most of these discourses of right-wing political leaders are made, are made from not a strong political organization, not really strong political parties. Probably all per personalistic vehicles or new political or, or organizations. So this is a characteristic that is most across cases, but Lisa can explain better the method. Yeah, um, disclaimer, we did not use chat GPT, we used the GPT model, which is um, basically different because of the something called temperature, which is basically the level of creativity of the model. Um, the, G, the chat GPT that everybody uses as like a, a variable level of creativity it means that uh, if you ask one question now and one question after five minutes, uh, you're going to have two different answers. Uh, the model, you can set the temperature to zero and you're going to assure replicability of uh, your analysis. So we're going to have the same results with the same model in three months from now. Um, uh, and then, yeah, we, we write the prompt with basically an instruction for the model to look for uh, these three types of freedom. So it, it's, it's not dictionary based, based. It's not that the model looked for the word freedom or like similar words. It looked for the idea, the framing of certain, for example, politics of, or, or discourse more in general that was framing ideas in these three uh, way, in the three types connected to freedom, like economic, uh, individual, and civil liberties. So like the thinking of our project is like uh, some sort of like inductive, deductive, inductive. So um, this is um, what we did. I just want to start by saying thank you so much for your very rich and helpful comments. I just want to comment on, on one there, um, the low capacity of constraining of regional organizations in Latin America versus EU. Uh, our sense actually there is, is that that constraining capacity is weak in both cases for different reasons. Obviously, the uh, uh, very um, distinct situations in, in, in both, but just looking at the different efforts by the European Union to employ um, a combination of economic and legal strategies against Poland and Hungary, um, against uh, uh, Kaczynski and Orban, um, first of all, they were very slow unfolding and, and not very not very effective at all. So, um, but that's a discussion for another time. And, and I was just going to say this, this is an initial mapping exercise. So um, all of your comments, uh, I, I really appreciate them, and they, they anticipate exactly where we want to go with this, questions of diffusion. Obviously, uh, the uh, international domestic linkages, that's a, almost a no-brainer. Um, the second image reversed uh, makes a lot of sense. I, all these things are very, very interesting. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. With this, I think we have to wrap up. And I would like to thank the presenters as well as our discussants uh, this afternoon. Um, and also the Instituto de Estudos Avanzados, uh, represented here by Professor Ari and Professor Moises, um, for your hospitality, for having us, um, all the technical team, of course, as well, who contributed to the event. Um, so thank you so much, and I hope this will be just 
be the initializer of fruitful discussions between us, between you and you and all of us uh, on topics of common interest and unfortunately also of common concern. So thank you so much and have a nice remainder of the day.